John, Dr. John Thalehammer is a scholar in residence at Northwestern College. He's author of the book Genesis Unbound, a provocative new look at the creation account. And uh, he authored an article, a very interesting article, under the heading Matters of Opinion, about the Bill Moyers PBS special on the book of Genesis. And uh, Dr. Salehammer uh, titled his article, What Have They Done to My Genesis? To my Genesis? And Dr. John Salehammer, good to have you with us. Hey, it's great to be here, Don. You're kind of in an airport, aren't you? Yeah, I'm in Portland in an airport waiting to go home, actually. Hey, that's great, and I, I, I hope we will help pass the time for you. <laughs> that's great. Thank you for being our guest. You know, I, you know, a lot of times when an evangelical re responds to Bill Moyer's program, uh, who are these liberals up there trying to talk about our Bible and not really deal with the historicity of it all? You give it a totally different spin. I do give it a spin, you know, and I use the analogy of Cinderella in that article, and that, that really struck me when I saw the first series, that, you know, here's uh, Cinderella. Uh, we've had her in our house all these years. She's been doing our work, making our life easier and, and answering our problems, and we don't recognize her beauty. And now, suddenly, as I was watching uh, these uh, individuals, various kinds of individuals, discuss the book of Genesis, I realized, they saw real beauty in these texts. In other words, when you talk about Cinderella there, of course, you're talking about our Bible, that Cinderella's like unto our Bible, that we keep her in our house to, uh, to dust things off and keep our theology comfortable. But when Moyers and his guests came around and talked about that book, they saw more to it than maybe we do. Exactly. Uh, to me, it was really refreshing. I, uh, to, to say it in a, in a really simple way, I was really proud of the Bible. Explain a little more. I mean, well, I, I want to hear what you're saying on this. Here, here are some very intelligent, very sensitive uh, people, individuals, lives. They're, they're very creative minds. And they're challenged by the Bible. They're taking the Bible seriously. They're, they're really intrigued by what the Bible has to say. And I thought, gee, you know, I've taught uh, Sunday school a lot of times uh, throughout the years. I've had some good classes, but... But, uh, you know, to have a group like this that was so interested in the Bible and its beauty and the way in which it is uh, written and how it speaks to basic needs today, they were taking the Bible seriously. But they weren't necessarily taking it literally. Exactly. No, for sure they were not taking it literally. They had, uh, I, you know, I'm not sure where they would stand on whether they believed any of these things were actually true. So from that standpoint, I don't think they would uh, have make any claim to be evangelical. Or in, in in a sense, Orthodox Christians, they weren't interested in it as a true, but they were interested in its beauty and its meaning for them, really, as outsiders. But there were many, they raised many, many questions. In other, I, I, I thought a number of them thought the Bible was politically incorrect. Yeah, well, it is. I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> I mean what can we say? Uh, it, it basically uh, gives us our world from God's point of view and... and I guess God is not interested in being too politically correct. I think it was that one rabbi was talking about the fact that most of the families in the Old Testament were dysfunctional. <laughs> right. Well, you know, I think they recognize that, that uh, the, these biblical stories are not always used uh, to be models. They're, they're used to show us that uh, life really has uh, genuine problems, and even God's elect have problems they have to sort through in their family. But they treated the stories... As you say in your article, they treated the stories seriously. It wasn't just the the uh, um, the atheist or the agnostic laughing at some of these stories in the Bible, which which they've been known to do. But they did give them respect, didn't they? I think that's what uh, really impressed me the most. That here are some individuals, serious, intelligent individuals that are taking the Bible seriously for what it says, and they, they were genuinely reading it and attempting to read it as sensitive readers and, and ask, now, how does this text, what does this story say to me personally, and what does it say to us as a people and, a, and as a nation? And, and uh, you know, I had to admit that uh, I haven't seen that kind of seriousness and that kind of engagement with the text at that level among evangelicals for a long time. Can you give some examples of what you're talking about? Well, I was intrigued with the, the example, the, the, the one I mentioned in the, uh, the article, and that is that, 
you know, here is the story of Cain and Abel. And, and I probably should say, you know, I'm only speaking for the first of that 10-part series. Uh, series. To be honest with you, I, uh, I wasn't a faithful. I don't, uh, you know, watch TV all the time, so I couldn't always. I tried to record it. But I'm speaking of that first uh, uh, discussion on Cain and Abel, where most of us read the story of Cain and Abel, and we're concerned about Cain. You know, what did Cain do that was wrong? I mean, I have sermons on what Cain did that was wrong. What they were seeing is not so much what Cain did, though that was of interest to them. They were interested in what happened to Abel. Here's a guy that apparently did everything right, and he ends up, uh, he's he's out at the first act. He's dead. And, you know, uh, how does this sort with one's relationship with God? Here, the, the good guy, you know, it's not this is not a Hollywood movie. The good guy gets killed in the second act. And and uh, Cain is out there building big, uh, making himself successful, yeah, building right. big cities. <laughs> Cain, and Cain, uh, you know, he repents, and I think they were they were careful to note that. And I think the the rabbi brought out a very important point, and that is in verse fifteen when Cain says, I guess it's thirteen when Cain says, "My iniquity is too much to bear." He's not complaining, and here I appreciate the rabbi because he's reading the Hebrew text. In the English, Cain says, "My iniquity." Oh, I'm sorry, Cain says, "My punishment is too much to bear." Then that's the way the English translators put it, and that looks like Cain, or yeah, Cain is is complaining. You know, this is this punishment is too much. But in Hebrew, he says, "Avoni, my my iniquity is too much to to bear to be forgiven." So Cain genuinely does repent, and they and and they saw that, and God was forgiving. But uh, with this repentance and for, and forgiveness, then he goes out and builds a great civilization. And meanwhile, now, now what, what did happen to Abel? What does the Bible say about Abel? Well, that's the that was what intrigued me. The Bible, as far as I know, doesn't say anything more about Abel. Now, later on in in the book of uh, Hebrews, he's certainly credited as, as a man of faith because he offered the good sacrifice. So he he is. He really became, for me, as I was watching that, uh, an example of this sort of, you know, when bad things happen to good people uh, kind of uh, situation. Here he did everything right. He has a man, a man of faith, and yet uh, he's uh, gone in the second act. And, and, and Cain, the bad guy, uh, ends up uh, with God's forgiveness uh, uh, dwelling with this great civilization. Now you're you're the author of a book, Genesis Unbound, a provocative new look at the creation account. Is that right? Right, that's right. So that do you believe that among evangelicals today, or within evangelical circles, that when we look at a text, when we look at a story, we take the thing for what it says and don't take the time to really stop and think what are the implications, uh, what's really going on here, what is the culture in which it was happening. I mean, what's really? I mean, I often think of of Noah building a boat in his backyard right. for a hundred years. I and I look at that and I say, now wait, the what in the world must have been going on in in his community as he's building this thing? There's no water around. Yeah, that's exactly right. Hey, you know, my concern in the book uh, Genesis Unbound that I wrote. In fact, the the title Unbound means I've tried to unbind the book of Genesis from its English translation. One of my main concerns is that our English translators often give us a a version of the text that uh, is in conformity to their own interpretation. And what I try to show, the, the book is really about Genesis 1 and 2, chapters 1 and 2, uh, a, an area that really wasn't covered very much in uh, Bill Moria's discussion. But I try to show that that text should be read as an actual, literal, historical account of God's creating the universe. At the same time, I try to show how this does not limit us to viewing the Earth and the universe as relatively uh, recent, so that uh, you can read the text literally with 24-hour days, one week, and at the same time, think of the uh, world and the universe as really billions of years old. That, that's the purpose and the, uh, the, the point of the book. Well, how can you do that? How can, <laughs> how can, you, how can you bring well, those two things together? I'll give you the short version. What happens is in well, Genesis 1... by the book, right. In, yeah, in Genesis 1-1, one, one, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I'll say it in Hebrew. 
The first word in the Hebrew Bible, barashit, beginning, does not mean a point in time. The word rashit means a duration of time, and it's an un unlimited or indefinite duration of time. So what Moses, when he writes that, is saying is that in this beginning un, uh, unspecified period of time, which he calls the rashit, God created the world that we see around us today. That includes sun, moon, stars, animals, you name it, God created it during that uh, period of time. What then is the rest of the chapter about? I then proceed to show that what the rest of the chapter is talking about, what God does in six 24-hour days in one week, he prepares the promised land as a place suitable for the man and the woman who he's going to create on the sixth day. So he's already created the universe. Uh -huh. The universe is billions of years old, and now he's going to create. He's going to make ha'aretz, and the word he uses is not earth, as our English translator. It's ha'aretz, which means the promised land, the land where he's going to put the man and the woman when he creates them. Uh -huh. So that's what you see God doing then in in this uh, six twenty-four hour days. I thought you were about to give me the gap theory. <laughs> no, no, the gap theory. Uh, you know, there, there's no evidence for the gap, and, and you know, you put all that in there, and then and, and chaos and everything. I, I, no, I think the gap theory is uh, is. I used to think it was dying a slow death, and now I think it's almost completely gone. All right, now then, how do you account for the and the earth was without form and void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, and God said? Well, I see. I show in the Hebrew Bible, particularly in Genesis and the Torah, the first five books, that the word there translated formless and void, it's tohu vavohu, means uninhabitable. It's the same word that's used to describe the wilderness later on in Exodus when the Israelites go out in the wilderness and they can't live there because it's uninhabitable. It's tohu. So what he's saying is when he created the universe, the, the promised land was not yet inhabitable. And so what he does is prepares the, the land. He uses the word asa, which in Hebrew means to make. It does not mean to create in the six days. God doesn't create in the six days. He asas, he makes. What is that then the word for create is? The word for create is bara, and that's, that's in Genesis right. 1 1, where he creates the universe. But the rest of the week, or I should say that that week then, he asas, and that means to make. And it's exactly, it has the same meaning as I might tell my son, Did you make your bed today? He didn't create it. He didn't create it. He made it. He prepared it as a fit place where when he goes to bed in the evening, it's suitable for him. What do you, hey, hey, hey folks, are you listening to this? What, what do you think about this? 505 7850. 1-800-730-2727. I've never heard that notion before. We'll talk about that some more. I'll be coming back in one minute with our guest, uh, Dr. John Salehammer. Stay with us. You're listening to Issues Etc. on the Jubilee Network. For a tape of today's program, call 1-800-844-0524. Welcome back to Issues Etc. Dr. John Salehammer sitting in a phone booth in Portland, Oregon, waiting to head home. And uh, Dr. Salehammer is a scholar in residence at Northwestern College. Now, this is Northwestern College in Roseville, Minnesota. All right. And he authored a number of books, including Genesis Unbound, a provocative new look at the creation account. I have a friend in no Roseville, Minnesota, Pastor Morris Vognis. Do you know him? Yes, Vognis, sure. Right. Uh, North Heights. Yeah, you know Maury at North Heights? Sure. Yeah, I knew him pretty well. He's a great guy, great pastor. And uh, I haven't seen him for years. I bet he's getting old. Well, he doesn't look any different, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right, let me ask you this. Now, now that what you're propounding here and what you're, you're sharing, and I, I haven't, I've read a lot of the theories on Genesis and so forth. I've never heard this before. Uh, when you present this to Old Testament scholars, which I am not, what kind of response do you get? Well, they, a, a similar response to what you just said, namely, this is a creative view. It, uh, uh, they'd never heard it before. And then they, they immediately recognize, you know, this answers every problem that, uh, uh, virtually every problem that we've uh, had with this text. And, and I think from that point, it almost sounds too good to be true. There's got to the be a glitch in there somewhere. Sir. <laughs> the first thing they want me to do is they, they want me to say, well, has anyone ever had this view before? I mean, why hasn't? And what I show in the book, I, I go to great lengths to show in the book, this is not a new view. It's actually a view that goes back two or 300 years. Now, you see, I like these guys in the 17th and the 16th century. When they wrote about the text, That all they had was the text. They, they didn't have science that they were reading into the text. 
And I try to show how a couple hundred years ago, scientists got a hold of the the uh, book of Genesis, and they made it into uh, quite a different kind of thing. But, you know, two or three hundred years ago, the promised land is about all, and, and Europe and so forth, is about the only uh, uh, part of the world anyone knew about. So it was very easy and very common to read this text in a... Uh, a kind of narrow sense. I'll add one more thing, and that is when, when they ask me, well, has anyone ever had this view, I take them immediately to the book of Jeremiah. In, in Jeremiah 27, 5, the Lord says to Jeremiah, go to the people who are dwelling in Haaretz, and he means by that the promised land. And he says, tell them that I made Haaretz, I made human beings, and I put the animals there, and I will give it to whomever I please. And I'm going to give it, he says in the next verse, to Nebuchadnezzar. Now, he doesn't give the world to Nebuchadnezzar. He doesn't give Australia to Nebuchadnezzar. He gives Haaretz, the land. So clearly, Jeremiah is reading Genesis 1 as if it's describing the promised land. All right. Our phone number is 505-785-1-800-730-2727. Let's go to Cindy on a car phone. Hi, Cindy. What's on your mind? Hi. Um, my husband and I were discussing probably something that was on one of your programs, and my husband asked me, um, how long do you think um, Adam and Eve were in the garden before they got removed? And did they have children, you know, you know, got, Adam saw that, you know, like Eve looked pretty good, and, and did they have children, you know, like in the garden? Were there children with them in the garden? And if there weren't, how come? I mean, you know what I mean? It wouldn't yes. take very long. All right. Thank you, Cindy. Okay. If not, why not? <laughs> That's a very interesting question. And, and now, I'm not sure that I can speak in any kind of an authoritative way from the text itself. My, if you ask, though, my opinion, my impression in the text is that uh, they sinned almost immediately. I, I mean, in my mind, I put it on Monday morning uh, after the, uh, the day of rest. And the reason I say that is that one of the points of Moses when he writes the whole of the Pentateuch, of which that's the introduction, is to show us that our hearts are bent toward disobeying God. They're not bent toward obeying God. And, and he wants to show that almost immediately, in a, in a best-case scenario, in paradise, we can't even obey the will of God. So it, it, it's to his advantage in his overall thesis to say that the human beings just disobeyed almost immediately. Now, would the 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 glitch or the fly in the ointment when people try to mix, let's say, evolution with creationism, and you know, the the statement that Pope John Paul came out with, and um, is the issue of bringing death into the picture before sin comes into the picture? Now, in your view, are there created beings out there who? from this beginning, whenever that is, who lived and died prior to the entrance of sin? The first thing I would say is that there are no human beings before Adam and Eve, and that's, uh, I don't get that from Genesis 1, I get that from Genesis 5, because it traces all humanity through one uh, couple, and that's Adam and Eve. So there are no other human beings besides uh, Adam and Eve. There is, however, in my opinion, uh, death. When God says to uh, Adam in chapter 2, do not eat of the tree, because the day you eat of the tree, motamut, he says in Hebrew, you shall surely die. He uses an expression that doesn't mean you're going to keel over dead. He means you're, you're going to be guilty of an offense that's punishable by death. So it's not mortality. And this is what Paul says in Romans 5 and I think in Romans 8, that it's not that death entered the world, but the verdict of the death penalty end of the world for which Christ then offers his sacrifice. So, you know, before Adam fell into sin, was was he living eternally? No, he had the tree of life. That's what the tree of life is there, and that's why when they're thrown out of the garden, that's really their execution. In the Hebrew Bible and the Torah, there are two ways to execute somebody. You can stone them, which is, was quite common, or you can cast them out of the community so that they're cut off from the community. You know, where they find life. And that's what God does. He casts them out of the, the protective environment of the Garden of Eden, and they no longer have access to the tree of life. Human beings are not born immortal souls. They are given eternal life, but 10 trillion years from now, you and I are still going to be uh, dependent upon God for our next breath. We don't become little gods. We don't become eternal beings ourselves through redemption. But th death, was not into the, death was not in the mix at that point, though, right? 
the 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 verdict of death in human beings was not, and hence they had free access to the tree of life. Had they not eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God, uh, the assumption from the narrative is, God would have allowed them to live forever by eating of the tree of life. When they disobeyed, then the verdict of death was cast upon them, and they could no longer, or not at all, have access to the tree of life. Well, you if, uh, if he swatted the mosquito, though, the mosquito would have died. Okay, so uh, while well, you're... Beginning with the assumption that mosquitoes are not a result of the fall. <laughs> <laughs> but if, I mean, you, then, well, you would say death had to be in the mix before. I mean, with the animals and the plants and everything yes, else. Certainly, exactly. If the animal's going to eat a, a, a plant, the plant's going to die. So it's not, uh, Paul doesn't say in Romans 5, death, he means, he says the verdict of death comes through all human beings, not that animals would never die. By one man death entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men. All men. For exactly. all had sinned. That's a very interesting, very interesting uh, position that you're taking there. And uh, you Let me say one thing, yeah, that, please in do. case somebody uh, uh, might misunderstand. I think where it does head, uh, 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 run its head into an evolutionary theory of the origin of human beings is, uh, in a very literal, everyday, normal reading of uh, Genesis 1 and 2, that the human beings are created from the dust of the ground, not from any kind of pre-existent uh, yeah. species. That, I think, is clear. But in terms of the age of the Earth and billions of years and stars and everything, uh, that's, as far as I'm concerned, the text is wide open to that. And yet, we're reading the text literally and historically to refer to actual concrete events. So, therefore, would you do you opt for an eternal universe? No, no, I, I think uh, there is a beginning to it, and uh, that, that God created, I, I, in the book I have a special section on, on this creatio ex nihilo, creation out of nothing. I think that is the lesson of Genesis 1-1, that God creates from nothing, not that nothing is a substance, but he, he starts with nothing and ends up at the end of the verse with the entire universe. Very interesting. Now, when you, when you compare, let's say, what you're saying with what Moyer's thing was saying, to try to find the meaning and the significance and to open up the text. And this is what you're claiming that evangelical Christians should do a lot more of. I think so. And what I'm trying to do with Genesis is say, look, these first two chapters are crucial for us. We can't understand who we are, what our world is. We can't understand our redemption. We can't understand where we have been, where we should go, God's purpose, God's will. All of the basic concepts of Christianity and the Christian life, our whole culture, are, are predicated in our reading these texts as literal, historical uh, events. And we should read them sensitively, but we should also uh, see them as, as describing the real world. So that you could, you could fit into your system the notion of a very, very, very old universe, but yet a very young paradise period. In exactly. other words... You you might even say within let's say six seven eight ten thousand oh, years yeah. from exactly the... and that's why and that fits in very well with uh, what modern science tells us and not everything that modern science tells us is true but not everything is false either and uh, you know they tell us that the the universe and the animals and they've been around here literally millions of years but human beings have only been around the last thirty thousand years very interesting. Dr. John Salham, I, I hope we helped you pass your time there in the Portland airport as <laughs> well, you're waiting to go it. home. And I thank you for taking the time for being with me today. That's great, Don. I enjoyed All it. right. Bye-bye right. now. Bye. Dr. John Salham, author of the book Genesis Unbound, a provocative new look at the creation account. And uh, interesting notion that in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, I mean, within this huge period of time, but yet the creation of man in the garden. So what we have in the six-day creation is not the creation of the universe, but the creation of this promised land, as he showed from the Hebrews, or the Hebrew language. I don't know. i got to think about that a little bit. We'll be coming back. Then you got other verses, of course, which say that in six days God created everything. We'll be coming back in just a few minutes, and... Uh, we're going to be talking about the quest for the historical Jesus. Stay with us. Join author and pastor Don Matzett Monday through Friday on Issues Etc. Issues Etc. is a listener-supported program. Your financial support is critical for our ministry to continue. For a cassette copy of today's program, call 1-800-844-0524. 
That's 1-800-844-0524. Opinions expressed are not necessarily in agreement with those of this station or the Jubilee Network. Our address is Post Office Box 9360, St. Louis, Missouri, 63117.